When you're ready to vote. Thank you. Well, welcome to the County Planning Committee on today, Tuesday, the 6th of September. I'm Councillor George Richardson and I'll be chairing this meeting. Can we start with the officers introducing themselves, please? Starting with Kirsty on my right. Kirsty Charlton, Committee Services. Neil Carter, I'm the solicitor to the committee. Andrew Inch, Strategic Development Manager. Graham Blakey, Principal Planning Officer. Chris Shields, Senior Planning Officer. Louisa Olivia, Senior Planning Officer. Thomas Bennett, Principal Policy Officer. Bill Harrison, Highways. Jarvis Robertson, Highways. And a Browning Senior Design Officer. Thank you, everyone. Do we have any apologies for absence, Kirsty? Councillors Boys, Moist, and Simpson. And any substitute members? Councillor Cool, you for Councillor Simpson. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Just with regards to agenda item 5B, just to let you know it's the ward, the ward that I actually serve, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, you might not be able to see me around the corner here. Sorry, I'll get Cal into gear. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Uh, Councillor Carl Marshall, uh, Stanley Division, just to declare an interest in item 5A that um, as the cabinet member for economic regeneration, I was previously very supportive of this inclusion in the County Durham plan and policy, but just to let members know that I've come here today with an open mind to hear um, what's got to be said on it. Thank you for that, Carl. Neil says it's okay, so. <laughs> on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of July and the special meeting on the 26th of July, 2022. Have we any comments or can we approve those minutes? That's a rec approved, thank you. Straight on to the applications to be determined. Land at Snipley Park, west of the A167 and north and south of the B6532. This will be for Graham to explain to us. We have two registered speakers for this item. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is the first of two applications for this site, um, but I first want to just maybe, before we go into the application in detail, just um, point out to members this one's a little bit different from what they may have uh, previously been involved in. Um, where we are currently this, we have um, three open applications on the site, uh, two major applications and also a smaller minor application for, for conversion of a, of a farmsteading. Um, but where we are at the moment is an appeal by the applicants have been lodged with the planning inspectorate against uh, what is non-determination of the planning application. Um, and that usually can happen if the, the local plan authorities fail to determine uh, applications within their statutory period. So the reports that have been presenting to, to you prior to today and obviously the presentations hereafter seek a resolution uh, to be granted to, for officers to proceed to that public inquiry in the new year with the planning inspectorate. Um, the applications will not be fully determined today by yourselves, but must be assessed as if they were to be today on what we have before us. Um, when voting members would be requested resolved to be minded to approve or minded to refuse the proposals as they stand based on motions put forward and seconded by committee members in the usual manner. At any point, if anybody wants any clarification on that throughout the meeting, officers will be happy to point that out. Turning to the site, Snipley Park is located to the northwest of the city of Durham. It sits between the A691 on the west and the A167 route, with the main Sacristan Road transecting the site. The site features no significant changes in levels, but falls towards existing drain fe drainage features, both internally and externally. Connections east of the A167 are possible, but these are limited in a limited number of locations. Predominantly, the site is made of currently of farmland with various highways, public rights of way and wooden pockets traversing and dotted across the site. The former Carter House pit, uh, centrally located in the site is, is, is the green area of woodland. 
um, and Folly Plantation to the northeast can be seen more clearly on this aerial photography uh, in the centre of the site and against the cropped fields uh, surrounding that. Also, New College can be picked up east of the 167, um, together with the park and ride to the southwest. Here is a plan illustrating the extent of the planning application against the allocation in the adopted County Durham plan. The land north outside of the allocation has been put forward compensatory habitats and improvements uh, required to, off uh, to offset the new built development. It should be noted that, the, that a large part of the allocation to the southwest is omitted from this application and forms part of a separate application. Next, we have a collection of photographs of the eastern portion of the site, showing the general appearance of it, together with its various uses, including public footpath uses. Also, uh, we of the western portion of the site, uh, here we can see the underpass from the A167 from Framu Gate Moor, centre bottom, and the roads traversing the site as well, uh, as well as the pylons that also cross the site. As the site is so large, we've broken down the indicative layout plan into three segments. Here is the northern part of the site. Predominantly given over to housing to the north and west, the linear park can be seen centrally around Carter House Pit and Folly Plantation, the spread of which narrows as it enters the built development areas. North of Potter House Lane, which marks the northern extent of the allocation, we can see the compensatory improvements to the remaining adjacent Greenbelt areas. Within this are proposed sports pitches to seek to address issues and shortfall elsewhere on the site. Also, vehicular access on A167 can be seen, as well as distances between this point, its likely bus route, new, new routing, and the new housing to the northwest. The inset area shows the junctions of Potterhouse Lane and Trouts Lane, with the Sacrist Road, which remain as enhanced T junction arrangements. Centrally within the site, we can see the local centre proposed adjacent to the sports pitches. This features indicatively a new primary school. However, the applicant disputes the council costings of its delivery, and so no agreement has been forthcoming to secure this facility. The local centre can be seen separated from the majority of the new housing areas by the retained Sacriston Road and the smaller finger of Linear Park spreading southwest. Development is hard up against the western boundary and the remaining part of the allocation, subject to a separate application. Finally, to the southern part of the site where it narrows, the realignment of the Sacristan Road can be seen. Access would still remain to New College, but would be via a new road junction. The section of Sacristan Road comes hard to the boundary of the site without any access to adjacent site shown on the, the master plan, and equally shows no elements of linear park or other non-highway means of accessibility to the park and ride site to the south. So, in summary, we can highlight that the site forms part of the allocation uh, for the proposed housing in the County Durham plan. The site is subject to policies in the plan as well as specific requirements of policy 5 within. Here it is considered at this moment in time that the application fails to meet several of the requirements of the plan and policy 5. Key among those are a requirement for the master plan of the site as a whole, facilities on site as required by policy 5, integration of the site with the wider area, both via accessible sustainable transport options and the provision of sustainable methods of energy use on site, as well as meeting the detailed needs and mitigation of ecological terms. So members of the committee, you are therefore respectfully requested to follow the recommendations of office in this case and be minded to refuse the proposals as they stand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Graham. <clears throat> We've got two speakers, as I think I mentioned. Uh, Grenville Holland, welcome back. You've got uh, five minutes, if you could keep to that, please. Then it'll be you, Mark, after that. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. I hadn't expected <coughs> such a short report from such a comprehensive uh, publication <coughs> by your officer. And there was one point that I wish to make. And <coughs> First of all, uh, in reading all of the re his reports, and I wanted to put both together, if I could, in my, call, in my discussion, um, <clears throat> I wanted to say that we congratulated him on the way that he had reached his conclusion that this application should be, uh, or he was minded to refuse, based on 13 specific failures. 
Now, my parish council fully uh, endorses all the reasons that he's given and supports this recommendation. However, in our <coughs> recent correspondence uh, with the planning officers at County Hall, and I wanted to get this one in early, the parish council has paid particular attention to one of those reasons for, for recommending refusal given in his report, <coughs> namely, failure to demonstrate fully the ability to feasibly and viably provide a district heating system across the development. Now, energy security is an ever-increasing threat to all our residents, not just in County Durham, but throughout the United Kingdom. As a result, in looking to the future, all new housing must be made as self-sufficient as possible, most especially in terms of its energy security. So, however, the so-called district energy heating system mentioned in this report will not in itself meet that essential provision. As my council has pointed out, potential renewable energy opportunities, of which there are several at this locality, <laughs> must be optimised. Otherwise, we'll never achieve that level of sustainability required in both the County Durham Plan Policy 33 and the Council's own Snipley Master Plan, which is stated ambition is Durham County Council's vision for Snipley Park is that of a high quality, zero carbon, well-designed community that will stand the test of time and leave a legacy which Durham will be proud of. Everyone in Durham applauds that ambition. <coughs> Therefore, zero carbon must be our main chosen target, not only at Snipley, but for all the other future homes envisaged in County Durham. Uh, in conclusion, Snipley Park offers the County Council a golden opportunity to lead the way nationally by building homes that are not only energy protected, but which also match the comfort and welfare needs of their future residents. Simply to confirm what I said at the outset, we endorse these excellent reports and fully support their recommendations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Granville. It's good to know you haven't changed your outlook. Mark, Mark Wilkes, if you could come in next as local member, please. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that we haven't been given a full list of an explanation of all of the um, of all of the reasoning behind the um, officer's recommendations. Um, colleagues, I, I'm speaking today in my capacity as a local member, and I'm going to be brief because you've got all the reasons to refuse these applications before you, um, and as other people may want to speak as well. I was a member of this planning committee for many years, and I saw some really great planning applications, and I also saw some pretty appalling ones too. What I never saw was a list of reasons so extensive for refusal of a planning application. And that goes for both these applications that have come in before you. Um, and what I never saw in all the years as a member of this committee... Mark, Mark excuse me, have you, have you got your microphone on? It's Sorry, yeah, I'll sit a bit closer. Sorry. So, yeah, what I never saw was a list of reasons so extensive for refusal of planning applications. And what I never saw in all the years as a member of this committee was a developer refused to agree to even basic Section 106 requirements of an application. It's as if they just don't want to pay for anything and had an expectation that we would just do whatever they wanted. As a local authority, we cannot allow a planning application to go through which places such a massive financial risk on this local authority. The combined cost of the Section 106 requirements alone for the two applications before you today may exceed £20 million, and it would be unthinkable for any local authority in the country to expect to pay for this scale of infrastructure. That is the risk of approving this in the following application. We're talking about over £10 million of Section 106 money for the schools on this site and off-site alone, which we will not get if this planning application is approved. I'm genuinely appalled at the arrogance which certain developers have and the way they seem to think that they can behave. We as a local authority are not cash cows for developers. This council must protect the integrity of the planning system and the pockets of our residents. 
How can a developer, knowing what is in the county pl Durham plan, knowing the national planning policy framework, fail to agree to local and national planning policies to the extent that we see before us today? I'm just going to pick up on, on, on a couple of points. Um, the County Durham plan is clear that on developments of this scale, developers must allocate land, for example, for allotments, or for money for sites elsewhere to provide them. And this site clearly requires dozens, if not hundreds, of allotments. Um, the reality is that the application is so woefully low on allotment space as being an insult to the County Durham plan and the open <coughs> space needs assessment. This part of Durham already has some of the lowest level of allotments already, and some of the reasons we're currently working on a new site for existing residents. It would be unacceptable to allow any developer to ignore the open needs space assessment to such an extent. Another area which um, Councillor Holland has just briefly commented on is in relation to a district heating system. The County Durham plan is clear that this should be looked at. As you will hear, um, well, as you will have heard, it's eminently possible for this site, and indeed the council is currently awaiting a report from the coal authority, which I expect will be clear in stating that this site. Well, I guess that's a question for Graham, and he can come back on anything else that's been said, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to sort of maybe go back to Councillor McCune and, and the position over the district heating system. Um, the position has been submitted by the applicant and obviously is part of, of any other aspect on the application in our assessment of, of where that sits. Um, our consultees and, and various other authorities are, are not necessarily 100% satisfied with, with what was being put before us. So part of commissioning a call authority to look into that through that report was to to come back and see if that is viable and if and again you know owing to the position of where we are on the application if we're not in agreement with with the applicant on that that's why we have that in as, as a reason for refusal at this stage so um in terms of of the dates on the applications um this one in particular came was made valid in late november 2021 which on the 13 week statutory requirement there would push us to the 15th of March uh, 2022 to determine that. So after that point, uh, we came at risk of non-determination. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> well, we now open it up to... Sorry, Chair, I didn't get a, an answer to my second point. I don't mean to jump in, but um, the second question was around the um, Snipely Master Plan because I remember the Council got one. I remember at the inspection the developers were asked to do one. Can you just give us some clarity on that, please? I want to bring in Tom Bennett. Yeah, morning, Carl. I'll um, answer that question. So, um, sometime during 2021, the council actually took the decision to lead on the preparation of the master plan for Snipley, and that was primarily because it was not readily apparent that the main parties were working collaborative collaboratively as part of their planning submissions. Um, and that's kind of been borne out by there's still no developer-led master plan on file in a, in a final format. So we took the, the lead on that and worked with some consultants to prepare our master plan that will hopefully future guide and um, the development of this site as it moves towards the delivery phase. So we, um, we consulted on that winter last year um, and it was adopted a few months back as the as the adopted council master plan for the site. Chair, can I just ask what committee signed that off? Was it, did it go to cabinet? Did it go to a planning committee? The 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 draft master plan was went to cabinet for, for consultation and the finalised version was approved under delegated powers. Sorry, Chair, just I don't, don't want to labour the point, but just, just to be clear, it was signed off by a Cabinet member and an officer. Thank you. Thank you for that. No, I'm not sure that I'm particularly enamoured with it. Alan, you want a question, please? Yeah, thank you, George. It was, just gone, it was procedure, and Graham said in the beginning if we had any questions for procedure, and it's just in relation to when the, when the application goes off to the inspectorate, does the 
the work between the case office, as in yourself, Graham, and the applicant, then comes to a halt. So that, because what, what I'm thinking is then the risk, if it goes to the inspectorate, then the, if the application was like sort of refused by the inspectorate, then the application will, could this it could be like sort of really like quite drawn out and like be like years away through going down this road. So just for clarification, the work sort of going forward until that inquiry happens. Sure, yeah, councillor. I mean, obviously we're assessing this at a snapshot today. So there's every opportunity, you know, there's dates from here where we agree a statement of common ground in the in the coming weeks. Um, and there's even scope after that before we get to inquiry in the middle of January. Um, to potentially work on reduction of those reasons for refusal if, if required and it's certainly something that's within our gift to do so one of the options you're outlining is you know dismissal at appeal and obviously that's that's part of the risk of appealing that it's also part of approval or refusal here today in terms of, of where we head with that so those are the key moments in the decision making but it may be that obviously what we attend public inquiry at is not exactly the same as what we have before us today we will work with the applicant where necessary to, to do that Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Kevin, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've been on planning committee since 2013. Um, just, just to get some sort of context on this, how many times have we been subject to uh, an appeal to the planning inspector because of non-determination? Is this the first one or is there, I, may, I may have missed others. Um, it's not necessarily something we keep track of, um, to be honest. Um, can only think through living memory as, as a case officer on various things myself as well as, as maybe other officers so um, if we may have a little look to see what we can find on in the background we, we can report back as, as quickly as we can while we continue thank you chair thank you Kevin I think that was perfectly well answered because it's a bit of a facetious question so we'll move on now if we can please can you switch your mic off it's over now if we've got no further questions for, to open the debate to the committee. Okay, Craig, you go first and then Patricia. Thank you. Uh, Craig Martin, councillor for North Lodge and Chesley Street. Um, I think this is a pretty easy, easy decision uh, from reading the report. The number of times as a, as a councillor I have come and sat on these committees doing actual harm to the people of Durham City, to the taxpayer, in terms of the money and the bills they'll have to foot in terms of doing this. So I'm, I'm minded to uh, agree with the planning officer's recommendations that we reject this application. Thank you for that, Craig. Patricia, you next, please. Patricia Joplin. Thank you. <clears throat> Patricia Joplin, Crook Ward. <clears throat> well, I feel the same as Craig. There are so many reasons why this should be uh, refused today. Um, we have a, a, an application here. It's absolutely enormous. It's on arable land. Well, you could say we've done it before on arable land. Fair comment. Um, we are going to uh, lose uh, uh, rights of way uh, playing fields, um, sports England have raised objections. Uh, the primary care at the moment in that area is already at capacity. And um, policy five, to me, is one of the most important ones, which is the uh, climate change and the natural environment. And I just cannot understand us still wanting to put through planning applications of this size 
where we know gas boilers are going to be banned, putting in gas boilers. Now, we can only go at what's in the report, and that's what's in the report. And I just think, and another thing I'd like to mention is that the Western, there's mention of a Western bypass. Who's going to pay for that? There is so much in here, you know, the play areas are dangerous, they're near pylons. All these sort of things, no electric charging points. These are things now that on planning applications we need to be looking at and we need to take seriously. We can't keep saying, oh, we'll do it next time. We need to do it now. And, and, and this is why I, will, I, I, I recommend, I'd like to um, put a, um, forward that we vote with the officer's recommendations, if I can get a seconder. Thank you. Patricia. Anyone else? Maura, you first, and then Isabella. Thank you, Chair. Um, my mum actually lives behind this development, um, so I know the area really well. And I'm not against the development in principle at all, because lots of my friends who I met while going to school in Councillor Wilkes's ward would, I think, really like to live on a development on that site. But what we're talking about doing is creating a community in County Durham, like all the ones we represent, that doesn't exist yet. And actually, the ability to do that isn't just an opportunity to make money. It's a massive privilege for whoever's able to do it. And on the basis of what I've seen today, the arguments put forward by officers and by the developer, I don't think that it does live up to that at all. For me, one of the big issues is sustainable transport. We're going to be encouraging people so that we can meet our net zero target nationally to move towards more sustainable forms of transportation. And yet, this doesn't seem to be something that's been taken seriously um, in putting it together. Having no comprehensive master plan of a site when we're talking about building in one of the busiest roadways, like what. The, the roads around there, they serve all the way out to Crook, they serve Lanchester all the way to Concert, they also go all the way north to, um, to Newcastle and then down into Durham. We've got a hospital down there, it's, it's such a busy area. And that was my old school run, I know what it's like. And so I just don't see how not having that master plan means I, I just see that there's going to be so much disruption if it's not planned properly to the running of the rest of the county. I, I'm, I'm just quite taken aback also that um, the developer can not put so much money into Section 106. You, talk, you want to build a new, a whole new community. That's what it takes. If, if you want the prize of being able to do that, it comes with the costs of having a properly functioning planning system that makes sure that those costs are are accurately spread out and I'm, I'm minded to, ref to support officer's, officer's recommendation to refuse and to second Councillor Jopling. Thank you very much for that Mara. Isabella, Isabella Roberts please next. Put your mic on please Isabella. I was at the site meeting yesterday and we had an in-depth talk to the officer that attended with us. Um, I, I didn't realise that how many homes were in the original plan are not the same as what's on this plan. There's actually a few more houses that's been moved in, uh, put in. And I definitely believe that all these small details matter because it's a future we're looking at. We want to leave something for our county and I fully support our officers in this recommendation. Thank you. Alan, Alan Bell, please, next. Yeah, thank you, George. Yeah, just very briefly, um, like all my colleagues, I'm, I'm, I'll definitely not be supporting, um, mindful to approve this application and be going with the officer's recommendation. But I would just like to make a comment for the, in relation to the, um, the developer. The, you know, this, this site was probably the, the jewel in the crown of the, of the County Durham plan. And it's so disappointing for the developer. You know, at the end of the day, we have to. I know, I know it's past the the the, the sort of the 13-week um, deadline. But at the end of the day, the size of this scheme is absolutely enormous. 
And so there's got to be a little bit give and take and sort of some space to allow the officers to bring the application together for, so it's right for everyone. And it's just so disappointing that the, the applicant is going down this road. And seriously, I would, you know, I'll be, it would be good if they could, you know, if they could like, review that decision and like, you know, work along with the officers to get the application right for everyone. Thank you, George. Thank you. <clears throat> Carl. Carl Marshall, please. Thanks, Chair. I think um, listening to the answers to, to some of the questions and listening to some of the comments, I think my me, um, me initial reaction to this is a bewilderment about how we've get, got to this stage where the council and the applicants had absolute loggerheads. You know, this was, like others have said on the committee, one of the jewels in the crown of the county plan, integral to delivering 30,000 new jobs and housing. Went through the examination in public. I sat through that over several days where the same arguments were put forward, led by Lib Dems. Um, you know, now we've got a master plan that was signed off by a Lib Dem cabinet member. This, oh. sorry, Chair, I mean, I've, I've listened quite carefully. Yes, but well, we, do, we don't need any political ins yeah. ins ins no problem, insinuation. Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the actual application. Um, but this, this now is enshrined in planning policy. We all need to accept the principle that this development is going to go ahead. And I think I'll come on to some of the um, 13 recommendations for refusal because I think in all my time in being involved in planning, I've never seen such a comprehensive list of reasons for refusal. Um, but this site's integral to, the, to, to dealing with the housing crisis. It deals with some of the social issues in, in the county with providing schools and medical care. And I don't think what we've heard today is that the applicant's saying they're not going to provide any of those. What they're saying is there's been issues in the negotiations that have gone on behind the scenes with the council officers. Non-determination of this application alone could cost this council in excess of £1 million. And the same people who are, um, who are going to make this decision are going to be crowing that the council have got to find £24 million worth of savings in a few weeks' time. But they're actually making the situation ten times worse by risking these things. Someone needs to get to the bottom of what's happened with this for me, Chair, and there's clearly been political leanings on officers behind the scenes, whether that's from the local ward members or others. Carl, you're still bringing in political sides of do, it. Just do. stick to the issues, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I do apologise. Chair, point of order. That planning member has just insulted me, and I would ask him that he withdraws that. Sorry, Chair, I didn't mention anybody's name, but I mean, personally, I've, I've written on a number of occasions raising this issue to say that the council's wandered into this blindly is nonsense because on three separate occasions over since November 2021, I've written to the council about this. Um, you know, I would have thought that everyone, have been, everyone would have been knuckle, knuckling down and trying to get this application to the, the point where the inspector got it to where there were some clear parameters there that needed Cal. to be met. I've heard enough. Thank you. Sorry, if, Chair. I mean, you, I've, I've, sat, I've sat quietly and listened to other members of the committee while they've yes, expressed but a, what, a view what and you're opinion. saying isn't helpful at all. Yeah, or, but it's my view and opinion or, as or, a Democratic. Con, please don't argue member. with me. Let me speak. It's not conducive to this meeting. <clears throat> now, unless you're going to stick to the issues, and this is your last chance, I'll ask you to put your mic off and, and shut up. But you may continue for now, please. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Chair, I think um, I'm worried about the, um, the, the, the exacerbation of the cost of living crisis with this. I'm worried about the, um, the, the, the non-delivery of a strategic you're housing. Still, you're still going on down the so, same sorry, dig down the same Chair, route. Chair, but these are material planning points that should be considered as part of the application. <clears throat> I'm not being political at this point. Well, it's about the economy. <laughs> exactly, that's where I was coming from. Cathy, you want to interject at this Sorry. point? Chair, I, just, uh, I would just like to request that we go straight to a vote now. We've had a, we've had a move and we've had a second. I would like to go straight to the vote. Chair, I don't think this is going to be helpful when it gets to appeal if you not allow members to speak in the planning committee that's actually determining this. Carl, you're not running this meeting. You're trying to. I'm just trying to give an opinion, Chair. You've given your opinion. 
and then you've strayed off onto oh. political routes all the time. I'm not going to take any more questions from yourself. Chair, but I was about to go on to talk about the, the pressures this is I going to put on wish, neighbouring areas by not delivering I, housing. I'm talking over the chairman here. I don't wish to hear what you're going to say Chair, now. It's all been done in bad faith. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. That all of this has been done in bad faith. That's what you're saying. That's your opinion. Yeah. It's not the opinion from what I hear and what I know. But Chair, I haven't even gone on to some of the income from council tax from the development and how it yes, will support and, and the at council's this, revenue At this position. moment in time, you and I are having an argument and it's going live on YouTube and I'm ashamed of that. I don't know whether you are. Chair, I'm just trying to just, just you're carry just out my trying democratic to, mark you're, right and you're have just, a, you're have just, a in a planning Excuse committee. me. You're just trying to drive this meeting and I'm not going to have it. At this point, we will go to the vote and I'll ask you to be quiet, please. Chair, I don't uh, think we've managed to examine the 13 reasons for, which was the final point I was wanting to make. We haven't been through them in, in any detail because some of them for me seem as if they, they, they haven't been addressed properly in the officer's report. Well, I'm sorry if you feel that way. But you're not allowing us to give me planning reasons why, but that's fine, Chair. I respect your position. Well, thank you and thank you for the sarcasm at the end. At this moment, we've got a, a mover, Patricia Joplin, under seconder. Maura, was that you? That we go with the officer's recommend, recommendation, which is that we are minded to refuse, which is what we can, what we can go with. Do you want to say anything, Neil? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just on the, the recommendation in the report that's about to be put to the vote, the, the reason it's phrased as minded to rather than to refuse or, or approve is clearly because the decision on determination of, of this application is no longer one for the council. That decision has essentially been taken away um, from the council and, and, and will be made by the, the planning inspectorate in connection with the appeal. So all members can do today is express a view one way or the other as to how they would have determined it had that situation in terms of the appeal not arisen and then that um, will be used as the basis to guide officers in the, the defence of the, the, the appeal. Thank you, Anil. So it's over to the vote. All those in favour of the officer's <coughs> recommendation minded to approve, please show. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> now you've got me baffled. To refuse. Yes, minded to refuse. Thank you. All those against? 92. That is carried. Minded to refuse. Can we move on to the second application, please? Also at Snipley and the other side of the road. We have three registered speakers for this application. I will now ask Graham Blakey, Principal Planning Officer, to uh, present his report, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, move on to the second planning application for uh, the Snipeley site. Uh, this one is a hybrid application, so it's not an outline like the previous application. It is for um, full permission for 370 dwellings uh, with an outline element for a park and ride extension to the southern part of the site, as well as some associated works around the, the Snipeley farm building complex. Again, just a brief reminder, although it's probably still fresh in members' mind, that we are um, assessing the applications that were put before you today in order to assist officers in proceeding to public inquiry. The location of the site sits to the southwest of the previous proposals, more related to the A691 and Snipeley Hall there on the western boundary of the site between the 691 and, and the application site. Again, the site predominantly is made up of farmland with hedgerow and woodland pockets. The area around the hall to the west of the application site is a lo locally designated historic parkland setting for the hall, going back to the 18th century. A strip of land parallel to the 691 can be seen on the other side of, of, of the main road and the site. This would contain the off-site compensatory improvements which are shown in set. Furthermore, part of the original complex uh, of buildings in Snipley Farmhouse is also not included in the application is subject to that third planning application referred to earlier. The area between the fire station and the park and ride site is proposed as the extension to the park and ride facility. 
Here we can see where the application site sits against the County Durham plan allocation. The area between the hall and the fire station is outside of that allocation and is proposed for use by the applicant as primary access and landscaping from the A691. When viewed from the A691, uh, the area of, of the site between the fire station and Snipe Hall presents as farmland. However, unfortunately, the large tree adjacent to the road has sadly succumbed during the storms uh, of late 2021. Access to the fire station and Snipley Farm as also can be visible uh, in the, the uppermost photograph. Below is an area, the area for the extension to the park and ride site. Here the site is seen as presenting uh, predominantly as farmland with woodland pockets again, um, framing the eastern and northern extents of the site. The framing of Snipley Hall by the woodland can also be seen more clearly in this in the aerial photography. Um, and also the complex of Snipley Farm is also more visible on the aerial photography adjacent to the, the fire station, as well as the line of polygons crossing the site from southwest to northeast, cutting through the trees. Furthermore, to, to, in order to insist in showing the detail of the application site, the layout has again been broken into segments. The northern section is shown here contains housing with small sections of parkland separating them. Densities can be seen to be lower in the northern part of the site. However, proximity of the new buildings to Snipley Hall is, can be seen clearly by this uh, layout. The southern part of the site and the main access can be seen with its landscape setting. Level differences here would see the proposed access road cut into the land form for this section. Some housing is accessed by the fire station of farm access past elements of the retained farm buildings. And the development pinches up against the eastern boundary in this location, reducing its integration of the linear park down to the park and ride. In more detail, we can see a central area of public open space linking across the main route through the site to the easement uh, as part of the overhead wires through the site. Within that, several visitor parking spaces are proposed, as is an electricity substation, a building close to the scale of half the depth of the detached garage. All of these squeeze the open space and the ability for it to function as an open space alongside being a drainage feature of the site. Towards the eastern boundary, we can see an arrangement of some of the smaller house types on site and the condensed gardens, which are proposed to some plots. At Snipley Hall, here we can see the interaction between it and the new development, where an, an existing property tied up against the site boundary is separated from the new development by a public footpath through the site and immediate frontage development. To the south of the site, we can see how the development interacts with the fire station, park and ride extension and existing park and ride operation. As a likely key route, the area lacks the definition of natural wayfinding from the site to the park and ride area. Furthermore, densities of new properties in this area are increased owing to the presence of three apartment blocks, which are three storeys in height and sit against the fire station and the proposed park and ride extension. A selection of these form part of the affordable housing and older person requirements for the site, where a commitment from Belief Housing to take the apartments has been provided by the applicant. Typically, the site will produce nominal street scenes in which properties can be seen ranging across different parts of the site. Material palettes show some variation across development, but are minimal for a site of this scale and do not assist as much as they could in providing distinct character areas across the development. So again, in summary, the site forms part of the housing allocation for the County Durham plan and is subject to requirements of policy five contained within. As a detailed application, the site is considered to not represent high quality design and deliver sufficient variation across the site at this time. A lack of integration across the allocation to meet the need of the comprehensive master plan of the site as the whole is also an issue. These result in an unattractive connections to the existing facilities adjacent to the site and exacerbate the previously discussed delivery of sustainable transport problems. Finally, agreement of on-site facilities and some off-site mitigation has not been reached and is fully dependent upon the delivery of the application previously determined. So members are committed, uh, of the committee are therefore, uh, again, respectively requested to follow the recommendations of officers in this case and be minded to refuse the proposals as they stand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Graham. Now we've got a speaker again from the Parish Council, Grenvin Holland. You'll have five minutes, Grenville, and then Mark as the local member to follow on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Parish Council for Durham City endorses the recommendation of the officer. It welcomes his report. And again, our concerns 
are the level of renewable energy that is being delivered on this site, amongst the other concerns that the officer has expressed. I don't want to add any more to what I said first. We support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Granville. Mark, Mark Wilkes, please, next. Thank you again, Chair. Um, the reality is that the bewilderment that Councillor Marshall referred to on the previous application um, is entirely because of the fact that the developers for both applications have sought to get away with not paying what is required for infrastructure. If the previous application was bad, then it's pretty clear that the Bellway application now before you is even worse. The County Durham plan outlines that the overall Sniperly site is for 1,700 properties. The total being proposed by both developers is 1,920. The 370 of these are being proposed by Bellway. The Bellway site is quite clearly over development. All of the reasons for rejecting the previous application pretty much apply to this application too, including the lack of section 106. However, there are additional points I'd like to raise. The County Durham plan is clear that there must be a significant distance from the new development to Sniperly Hall. It's, it's actually written in the County Durham plan. This is not the case and the existing homeowners adjacent to the site will be significantly impacted. They, a promise was made to them in the County Durham plan and it's not going to be fulfilled if this application goes through. And as Councillor McEwnas earlier said that the sustainable transport issue is critical and indeed for this development the lack of any penetration into the site for public transport is completely unacceptable. We know the problems we have with congestion around Durham City. To suggest that we build developments where you can't even get a bus through them is laughable. Failure to demonstrate a functioning surface water drainage system. That's what it says in the report. I I'm that's shocking given the need for new developments to protect against flooding. Insufficient information provided to ensure the required ecological protections. Really? We've just declared an ecological emergency. A complete failure to provide the required open space needs under the County Durham plan. I didn't think it was possible to see a worse application than the previous one. And I hope that members of the committee will follow the officer's recommendation. And Councillor Marshall might also want to be reminded that this local authority is not in the pockets of developers. Thank you, Mark. We can do without the personal comments from anyone. Now then, we've got uh, supporter stroke applicant, James Hall, planning director. You'll have up to five minutes to speak. And can you address the committee, please? Thank you, Chair. I'm James Hall, the agent on the application. I've been working in your county for over 22 years now, with positive outcomes almost every time. I'm involved in several of your other housing allocations in your adopted plan. I helped secure the Sniperly allocation. I attended the examinations, familiar with a number of people in the room through that, to fully understand the issues. And I recognise what an important site this is in the city, also the city where I studied at university. We have worked constructively since April 2020 in preparing the application. We've engaged fully with officers, including on the master plan process. I personally have attended over 50 meetings with officers and consultees, in addition to all the meetings we're having with the other developer for the remainder of the site. Bellway have produced their own master plan, their own design code, their own design and access statement. And I'm gonna come on to tell you how they've also submitted a revised scheme which has been rejected by your officers. Bellway have undoubtedly gone above and beyond what is normally expected of them and compared to other schemes in the region. They've put forward 10 exemplar dwellings well ahead of building regulations requirements, a wide variety of house types and styles, imaginative sustainable urban drainage, a substantial linear park, the scale of this development you might not be picking up is a huge park, a large area of greenbelt compensation and biodiversity net gain land, to mention just a few in the time I'm given. We have made numerous changes and iterations. We've definitely listened. We've reduced the numbers from 450 at examination to 370, and we've now resubmitted a scheme for 368 units and corrected most of the minor details 
that you've just been shown on screen. There is no mention in your report of our revised scheme that we've submitted, which I actually think is a fundamental flaw in the process. We are now consulting on that scheme ourselves. We have a live website. We've mail shotted all the residents in the area. We have five character areas. We've retained the farm buildings where they're capable of retention. We are proposing a link road. We have a strong landscape framework and we are proposing through that link road to look at bus services. We always accepted we would pay our fair and proportionate share of Section 106 monies. That is offered in writing and at numerous meetings. We've agreed to transfer the park and ride land to Durham because that was the request of the council. We've agreed to pay the financial request from the NHS, Sport England, etc. This is all in the documents. We've had our own costings done on a primary school simply to check the accuracy of those costings. We've never questioned the need for it. Likewise, we're ready to pay for secondary places. We're providing new bus stops, new foot and cycle ways. We've redesigned the link to the park and ride, which is not before you. All dwellings will be within 500 metres of a bus stop. The link road will be bus capable. Several of the reasons for refusal do not seem to apply to our scheme. Several have been agreed with consultees and can be conditioned. Biodiversity net gain, we are in excess of the 10% required. We believe that could just be conditioned and controlled. Likewise, drainage, air quality and noise, we cannot understand why these are reason, proposed reasons for refusal. Several more of these can simply be described as the need to agree. The Section 106 costs and triggers. We've never said we won't deliver on schools, health, sport, allotments, the management of everything. Bellway are not ducking any of their responsibilities or the policy requirements. We believe we comply fully. This is an allocated site. It should not be going to a public inquiry. Every time we thought we were close to a resolution, something else was put before us. Your officers indicated there were only a couple of issues to resolve in their initial correspondence with the planning inspectorate, not with us. This is a formal document. They requested an informal hearing, which is where you sit round a table in an informal chat scenario. We urge members to ask your officers to engage in meaningful common ground meetings, and I would ask you to defer this decision pending those. I have to, there are a number of untruths that have been said today. I would just urge you all to read the documents that we've submitted. There is still a chance to have a constructive engagement. We are actively out to consultation as I speak. The inquiry is not until January 2023. The full team is here, and I would add we are sitting next to the adjacent developer. We are in regular discussions. There is a joint master plan. There's actually two for this site. There's the councils and there's our own, and they are not far apart in terms of detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, James. <clears throat> well said. But in spite of all that you have said, are you going to withdraw the application you've sent in now so there can be more discussions? Well, no, Chair, simply for the reason that we, we believed we were down to two or three or maybe four reasons between us, which has been discussed in meetings. Obviously, we've now been presented with 13, which has come as quite a shock to both developers and disappointment but what we actually think you could do is narrow down the issues and that one the main reason being that will focus the issues for the inquiry itself and the costs and the time involved for everybody but the feeling has always been that the officers have been negotiating with us with one hand tied behind their back if I'm being honest with you so for that reason we believe we need to go to a, pu to an, a public inquiry which I'm, hopefully I've conveyed is a very rare occurrence. I mean, there was no data given earlier, but the appealing non-determination is actually the first time I've ever done it in my career. So we don't do this lightly. Right, so you, you want your cake and you want to eat it as well. Anybody got any questions for well, the Chair, is, if that is a question, then we, do, we, would, we would simply ask that the documents we've put in are properly taken into account. The 368 unit scheme, Mr. Inch will be able to tell you, he, he uploaded it one day and he took it down the next. 
So it's not being consulted upon by the council, it is by ourselves. And it does deal with a few of these relatively minor points. But, and it was a valid submission. And we are in an active negotiation over the legal agreement and the payments. Well, if you, if you want to say what you have said, then it would only be common courtesy to withdraw the application to go for non-determination and then talk again. Now, you've jumped the gun, in my opinion, and uh, we'll now move on to questions to yourself and, and uh, any of the uh, parish councillors. Or... Patricia, you have a question. Can you speak to your mic, please, Tricia? Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Just like clarification on the comment, that our officers are determining these planning applications with, what do you mean with one hand behind their back? That sounds a bit shifty to me. Did everybody hear that? Because you, Patricia, you were talking away from the mic and uh, no, Isabella couldn't. Can you speak that? Uh, I yes, know it's courtesy yes. to talk to James. Right. But I've asked um, the gentleman if he would clarify what he meant by one hand, the, our officers determined this application with one hand behind their back. I also commented that it sounded a bit shifty to me. James, can you answer that, please? Yes, I mean, I can't comment on the shifty, obviously, that's, <laughs> that's an interpretation, but what, all I'm saying is from experience, we've been able to get, you've been a very positive council over the years, we've been able to reach a mutually acceptable solution within a two-year period on all major planning applications. We felt like every time we were getting close on any particular issue that's before you, that the, we weren't able to reach that final agreement. And it, it just smacked of something else going on in the background, but we don't know what that is, clearly. But equally, our main issue here is what we have put in front of yourselves as an authority. I'm not satisfied has been properly presented today. We've been painted as a combination, as, as if we've not been forthcoming, but we have consistently revised the scheme, made additional offers, gone off and done additional work. You know, there's been no mention at all that we produced a design code, for example, and our own master plan, and have done our own consultation, because we felt people should be made aware of that. And is all, all that fitting in with the county plan and what you've been asked to do? You said what you have done, but have you done what you were requested to do by the council? You've made it extremely difficult from what I can understand. Uh, no, I'd refute that. I think we have done what... I mean, the numbers now, it, it, we've been presented as if the Bellway proposal is an overdevelopment, but the density is well within accepted range. The numbers are considerably lower than we talked about at the plan examination, the County Durham plan. So I'd suggest we're in accordance on the numbers. In terms of each item of the policy, we've never hesitated in agreeing the park and ride extension, contribution and accepting the need for the school. And the list goes on. I, I presume you don't want me to go through every item, but that was in my five minute presentation. So I, I don't think we are ducking any of our obligations with m meeting the biodiversity net gain, greenbelt compensation, linkages through the site. For the record, Bellway always very early on accepted the need for a link to the edge of their site. So we're, no, I genuinely think you, you do need to judge the Bellway scheme on its merits. And we have always tried to work constructively. We've never not turned up to a meeting. We've, always done the extra work that's been required of us. Um, I don't know, if there, I mean, if there's any specific queries, and we're happy to answer them. We've got the highways and transport consultant with me as well. But I'll still come back to my previous point. You've jumped in to non-determination. You say you're willing to talk, and you have talked, and you've done this and that and the other, but you've jumped into non-determination. If you withdraw that, and then you can talk, because this is a site that is approved for housing, as it's been suggested by someone, it's the jewel in the crown. So we want it to be right, and it just isn't right at the moment. And I think the officer has explained that perfectly well. You've refuted that, but if that's so, you need to get together and not go for non-determination. If, 
if you'd let me, yeah, if you'd like me to answer. The, I don't consider jumping in as I've been working on this since April 2020. We have waited, where are we now, two and a half years? That is not jumping in. And at the end of the day, the, the, two, the two developers before you have done everything they can within their gift. You know, they own the sites. They do need to make some progress. With this, I think the 13 reasons for refusal has proven what I've said. We went, we went into, before this report came out last week, we thought there were three or four areas between us. What I'm urging you to do is at least look at the detail that Bellway have behind their application when I'm not confident it's all been presented to you today. And your officers aren't refuting that we tried to put in a different set of drawings and documents. And we can continue the common ground discussions. We are obliged to do that by the planning inspector and we want to do that. But I, I don't see, I would, put, I would prefer it if, you're, if your councillors at least took the time to your next committee to actually look at what we've put in. It isn't materially going to change the process or the timetable. Well, I think we've done that to death and we're not going to agree, you, yourself and myself. Uh, Cathy, was your hand up first and then Maura, please? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. I was just wondering why we haven't seen sight of, it, of any of these revised documents. Thanks, Councillor Hunt. Yeah, I think as Mr. Hall mentioned, there was a further submission. Um, there was a partial submission made, and then we were notified that they intended to appeal non-determination. Um, and then they submitted the further plans, and we advised that wouldn't they be better to withhold submitting the appeal so that we could properly consider the revised scheme, but the developer chose to uh, proceed with their appeal rather than allow us the proper opportunity to consider uh, their revised proposals. So as far as the scheme that we've considered and the one that's before you now is, is for 370 dwellings rather than their revised scheme, which as Ms. Hall has said, they are currently themselves consulting on as part of the appeal process. Thank you for that. Uh, no, we'll just leave that for a minute. Uh, Maura McKeegan, you can ask your question, please. Thank you. I just wanted a clarification of what we're meant to be determining today. Are we determining the information that we have in the report, or are we determining the information that was submitted after the appeal had been submitted? It's slightly confusing as a member of the committee. Thank you for that, Maura. We are determining what is in the report, which is all we can do today, whatever people say. You want to come back? So I'm, I understand that, um, but if there's been a revision afterwards, then whatever we decide today is surely defunct in some ways because it's no longer what the scheme is. Um, I'm, I, I still find, I, I think it's quite messy really, and I'm not sure why it's in front of us in the state it's in. Well, I can only say that you heard what the chief planning explained, that it, it didn't happen that way. We can only discuss what's in front of us today and forget what's been said or suggested, because it's not relevant to today. Patricia and then Cathy, please, a question. Thank you, Chair. I think that you have given the applicant a way out here by asking him to withdraw today so that these further plans can be discussed and the things that are in this report, especially policy five, that that is looked at in, in a proper manner and then brought back to this committee. It's not, I don't think we should defer it. I think it's up to the applicant if he wants to withdraw it because we're here to determine, as you said, what is on this paper. Thanks for that, Patricia. Before I ask you, Cathy, uh, Neil just wants a word, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Just, just on the issue of uh, amendments to the, to the application, um, it's, it's not unusual in, in my experience for um, applications which are subject to appeal um, to be amended in the, in, the, in the course of that appeal process. And that's something that will be, will be picked up, um, as I say, in that appeal process. Um, clearly, the, there's an application 
that's before you today, which is the, the detail of which is in the report. Um, any amendment to that will be picked up in the in the appeal process in, in the usual way. Thank you, Neil. <coughs> Cathy, Cathy Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Um, to be fair, I think Councillor Joplin's uh, pretty much said what I was going to say. Um, that was him saying that this document that we haven't had sight of, so I'll just say that, in my opinion, then, if you wanted to withdraw, then... Well, it was supposedly one question each. Mara, do you have a, a supplementary? No, I was just wondering, are we still asking factual questions or are we on to the discussion section of the meeting? No, if, if yours wasn't a question, I think we're through with questions and we now open the debate to the committee, please. Cal, Cal Marshall, you go first. Thanks, Chair. I just think we've, um, we've heard this morning that the, the applicant and our officers have met loggerheads on things. I think it's unfair at this stage in the process to ask the applicant to withdraw their appeal. Um, but I do think we should be trying everything as a council of sitting down and trying to iron out these issues. Some of them do seem to have some credibility. I know the, um, the, the, the Greenbelt site up in Sherburn Road had a 19% uplift from the inspection in that one, um, whereas this one's proposing a 12%, I believe. Um, looking at the figures in the report, so there seems to me to be some, some, some issues there that could well be ironed out. And for me, I'm wondering whether there's a time to defer this, to allow everyone to give it one last time to try and stop this going to repeal to get these things ironed out. Um, and if it doesn't, the application can come back here and we can sit and have the same discussion again. Um, I don't know whether Andrew or the team can give us some idea on the time scales. I do have some other comments I'd like to make, but I'd be happy to hear Andrew's views on that. Thanks, Councillor Marshall. Um, I mean, as part of the appeal process and, and agreeing common ground on these matters, we have a meeting with the with the appellants this week, um, where we'll be discussing all of the issues and, and what the council's position is um, based on both the previous application and whatever the council, whatever the committee's resolution is on this particular item. So that discussion is ongoing as, as part of the appeal process. Carry on. Just, Carry just on. very briefly, and to finish, I think the only thing that's changed since 2020 and now is politics. We've got the two ward members leading the council, and I'll leave that point there because the developers alluded to it as well. But I think I want that recorded in the minutes. There's just something stinks about this. Well, Once again, Chair, point of order, I'd like the member referring to the lawyers in this building because he can't keep making accusations against elected members in public meetings. It is pretty clear to me that what he's not happy with is he's not getting what he wants. And it's what the residents of this county want that matters. Once again, <coughs> Carl, you've upset somebody. Please stick to the policies and leave the... I apologise that Mark's taken offence at my comments. Thank you. Mara, do you want to uh, address the committee, please? I'm just confused, Chair, um, by so many things. I mean, the applications that have come before us today do have legitimate planning grounds for us to refuse them, and that is fair enough. But this doesn't feel like any committee meeting I've been in before because it just feels like a bit of a dog's dinner. There's clearly been some massive breakdown of communication at some point between the developers, the council, um, and the stakeholders involved. Um, and I'm not going to speculate on any reasons for that at all. What I'm going to say is there are going to be nearly 2,000 families who are going to move into houses on that site at some point in the future. And they're County Durham people. There's a need for housing on that site. It's in the County Durham plan. It's going to happen. The job that we have as an authority and, and the job that the developers have as well, um, and particularly the job of this planning committee, is to ensure that those houses and those communities are fit for purpose going forward and if I'm honest I don't know how we're at the point where the application hasn't been determined and people have gone in for appeal and I also don't know how we're at the point where even after all of that time there's so much of a gulf between the council and the developers and I do think that this is one of those opportunities where if it's possible 
we defer because I feel really uncomfortable being asked to make a decision on an application when I know that there have been revisions to it since it was first put in. And when this has happened to me on planning committees before, I've supported deferral. So I'm happy, if Councillor Marshall's already proposed deferral, I'm happy to second deferral if it's within the time frame within the appeal process. Thank you for that for more. Uh, Patricia Joplin, please. Chair. <laughs> Nobody's saying houses shouldn't be built on that site. What we want are the right houses built on that site. What we want are houses that are going to be sustainable. We'd, you could, it's too easy to build a house and give families all the problems of sorting out their, their uh, eco problems. And as things get banned and the government changes policy, nobody's got any control over that. And if we keep giving planning permission for houses that are not fit for purpose, because that's, that's the nub of it, that nobody's saying we shouldn't have houses on that site. It's what is going on. And we bring this up, as you know, on planning uh, uh, committees time and time again about the boilers, about providing uh, sensible heating, you know, and nothing gets done. And all the while, this is, these two applications together is the most enormous amount of houses. And we've got to get it right. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks for that, Patricia. Craig, Craig Martin, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my comments from the previous uh, um, application, same as before, you know, planning officers are saying there's not enough X, Y, and Z. It doesn't comply with the council plan. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's the same again. And just, just a reminder here, we, we're kind of, there's a lot of accusations being thrown around here about, you know, such and such is doing this, not or not doing this, et cetera, et cetera. But you remember, if we, if, if, if we don't get it right, all right, and, and housing will be going on that site at some point in the future, whether it happens in a couple of years, whether it happens in 10 years because of delays from the uh, planning appeal, if we don't get it right, Taxpayer has to pay the cost of kind of dealing with these problems. The people that win in this are the developers because they they get a bigger slice of the profit pie rather than that profit being used to subsidise 106 agreements that, that mean that we can use that money instead of going to profits to benefit our communities. So we need to get this right. Um, talking about deferment, see, to me, deferment amendments are about small changes if we were sat in this room right now and 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 the discussion was do you know what we've got a green space issue we've got a green space issue we need to sort the park out and we need to go away and redo it i'd, I'd be sat here saying yeah i think deferment might be the right option but I, but 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 to, to, for the scope and scale of how many things that we need to get sorted out for this to be acceptable from our planning con, uh, officers uh, opinions. Oh, sorry, let, let, let's remember here, it's not, when we say planning officer's opinions, that it's actually whether or not it complies with the county plan, in their opinion, all right, a, a, an actual document, so that it complies with it. So there's so many things wrong with it. I, I'd, I'd really need to be convinced that a deferment of one meeting of two meetings would actually solve this problem. And I think some of the comments that have already been made, that, you know, the, the developer has kind of pushed this forward to committee, um, and wants it to be determined, you know, they, they could have they could have themselves deferred it. So I, I, I'm I'm of the the mind that I think we should uh, agree with the planning officer's recommendations and refuse it. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Excuse me, Cathy first, and then Mara. You still want to come back? Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, listening to all, the, all of the things, I think what is in front of us is what we've got to determine, and I will second Councillor Marshall's proposal. Martin. Thank you. Maura, you want to come in again, please? Yeah, um, you know, I think Councillor Martin and I have a lot of common ground on this, but, you know, it, this is going to appeal for non-determination. I think that um, the idea that, I mean, quite frankly, this should have been ironed out before we got to this point. And I think that, you know, it's not been clearly. Um, so that's why I think the deferral's 
the right way to go because what you actually need is a short period of time of intensive working together and finding of common ground. Um, and I, I also wanted to pick up on something I should have said earlier to the developers, which I didn't, and that's around Section 106. I understand when people challenge Section 106, but fundamentally, no one knows more about building schools than a local authority. Um, I've gone through this process in my own ward, and if you have a look, well, in our experience, you get the Section 106 money in, but even with the 106 that you get, there's still um, a lot that the taxpayer has to pay towards building that school even though it's come as a result of a development. So I, I actually think that our Section 106 nationally should be set higher because I think that developer contribution should be higher for these. So I do take a little bit of tension with the idea of challenging the council too much on Section 106 and having that as a stumbling block to build in a housing development because it is so necessary and it never covers all the costs it needs to. Thank you, Mara. Well spoken. Uh, Neil wants to come in. Thank you, Chair. It's just a, a point on deferral. So I've been reminded by the, the planning officer as to the, the timetable for the appeal. Um, so clearly, if, if the consideration of this application was deferred until October, um, that does cut across some of the, 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 the timescales that we, we have to comply with in, in terms of the appeal, so that you know, there's a statement of common ground, statement of case, etc. Um, it doesn't really work out, Councillor McEwen, unfortunately, in terms of that timetable. Okay, go, Maura, and then you, Cal. Um, I, I appreciate that, um, and you know, that was a concern I had when I made the case earlier that I made. But do we not have a case to make to the inspector or is there any mechanism for us to make the case that this is clearly a very complex site and it's very clearly a complex issue um, and that little bit of time to prepare for the committee um, to have a bit more understanding of the issue um, would help with the appeal process in general? Yeah, I mean, look, we can, we can always go back to the planning inspector and ask for the timetable to be revised, but at, at this stage, that, that's an unknown. Um, they may well say, no, sorry, this is the, the programme, you need to stick to it. Or alternatively, as you, as you point out, they may have some sympathy with um, the attempt to, to narrow the issues, um, which you know clearly is desirable from, from everyone's point of view in, in the context of that appeal. Um, but the bottom line is we, we don't know what, res what, what response we're likely to get. Um, and at this stage, it's therefore difficult to say one way or the other. Thank you. Uh, Carl, did you want to come and say something? Just to basically say, Chair, I mean, it's, it's obviously come along now to this committee today after, after recess. We've had a number of years. I'm presuming that at some point the officers could have brought a report here that said they wanted refusal and we could have taken that decision ourselves before now. That decision hasn't been taken, so it's gone to appeal. I just think with the information here, we're not too far away from the council and the developer being able to get their heads together, as long as we're not going to be starting to move the goalposts again. So I would have thought that to try and allow that to happen, the best thing for us to do is just to defer the application a day and let them get their heads together. And if, if that doesn't happen, there's still time for this report to come back to this committee um, in October. To, to basically make a decision one way or another. But regardless of which, this, this application and the previous one, it'll be, to, it'll be determined by one planned inspector, not by this committee. Thank you, uh, Alan, Alan Bell, and then Cathy again, please. Thank you, George. Yeah, and leading on from what Carl says there, um, amongst all the deferment discussion, were you not the decision maker today, unfortunately? Were you just minded to make a comment to be, you know, to defer the application would require, it's going back to the beginning, what you said, George, in relation that the applicant would have to withdraw the application for us then to become the decision maker in the, in the process. And then as Carl says, we're probably not a million miles away. It would be good if we could, you know, come back to that stage where the developer and the plan, plan case officers are at the table. However, to get to that stage, the, would, the application would need to be 
sort of withdrawn from the inspectorate because at this moment in time as it, it's all come out it's like the inspectorate is the, at today is the decision maker in in this in this application unfortunately we are not we only been asked for a comment yes and i will repeat that we are <sighs> this this land is is approved for building on and it will get built on at some time in the future if people would only act sensibly Kathy, please. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say pretty much what Councillor Bell's just said. Um, you yourself have asked the applicant whether they would withdraw. Uh, if, they, if they refuse to withdraw, I can't see how deferral will be any different, so I move that we go to a vote. Thank you. If we've got no other comments, we've got a mover and a second for deferment. All those in favour of deferment, please raise your hands. All those against deferment. That's lost. There won't be a deferment. So we move on to the substantive motion to be minded to refuse. All those in favour of being minded to refuse. All those against? Any abstentions? One. Thank you for that. So that goes with the officer's recommendation. We'll move on next to land to the west of Valley Road, Pelton. The third application is an ap outline application for the erection of up to 80 dwellings with associated infrastructure. And we'll welcome Louisa. Oliveira for her debut. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. This is an outline application for the erection of up to 80 dwellings and associated infrastructure with all matters reserved except access. So this is a revised description as the original application referred to 150 dwellings over a larger area. The site is on land to the west of Valley Road, Pelden Fell, near to Chesley Street. So this is the red line location plan for the 5.64 hectare site. The plan also shows the first phase of the development to the north, and that is nearing completion at the moment, and through which the site is to be accessed. Over to the east is a further recently completed housing scheme. The red line extends narrowly to the east so that the site can link to a public right of way over to the southeast. So from the aerial photograph here, you can clearly see that this is agricultural land, with agricultural land also to the west and to the south. You can see Whitehall Wood, a local wildlife site to the southeast. The services within Pelton Bell to the northeast include a GP surgery, pharmacy, a shop, a post office, a community center and play park and a takeaway. And they're approximately 800 meters away from the center of the site. So the first photograph here is within the site, looking south towards Whitehall Woods, and the second is looking north towards phase one. The left photograph is looking east towards the adjacent housing scheme, and the second is looking west towards open pasture. So the first photograph here shows the proposed access, which is the access which has already been formed for phase one. And then the second photograph there shows the area of highway verge referred to in the report between the footpath in front of phase one and the footpath in front of neighbouring Valley Road. 
So the applicant has agreed that this is to be upgraded to a footpath and this can be controlled via a condition. However, one update to the report is that we suggest an additional condition to that detailed in the report to ensure a new section 278 agreement purely for these works and the wording would be as follows. No individual dwelling on phase two shall be occupied until plans to provide a new footway link connecting between the footpath to the north of phase one and the footpath at Valley Road have been submitted to and improved in writing by the local planning authority, implemented on site and agreed with a section 278 agreement. So this is the amended indicative layout for the 80 homes taking access through phase one. The two areas of housing are within the north of the site and the centre of the site with areas of open space surrounding the areas of housing and with larger areas of open space and suds features concentrated in the south and east. There are footpath links connecting to the first phase to the north, to the open space and to the footpath to the east. So if we turn to consultee responses and representations. Spatial policy advised that the site should be assessed against policy six of the County Durham Plan. Further policies are identified which are relevant to detailed elements of the proposal and they have requested a contribution for open space. National Highways, the Highways Authority, Northumbrian Water, Environmental Health which encompasses air quality, pollution control and contaminated land, design and conservation, public rights of way, drainage team, archaeology, arbor oil culture, sustainable travel, Travel and Travel Plans officers have all raised no objections subject to conditions and informatives where appropriate. Housing Delivery, Ecology and Landscape accept the principle with a Section 106 to secure affordable housing and biodiversity net gain with detail to be addressed within the Reserve Matters application to follow. School Places Officer and the NHS request contributions to be secured by a Section 106. We have had one letter of objection from the public with concerns over developer consultation and survey work, additional traffic and impact on highway and air quality, poor pedestrian links and pressures on GP surgeries. So turning to planning considerations and conclusions, the site is not allocated for any development in the County Durham plan, therefore policy six and 10 applies. The amended proposal is considered to be well related to Pelton Fell enabling alternative options to the private motor car to reach a range of services. Traffic and landscape impacts are acceptable, as is the loss of agricultural land and the mineral resource. Conditions can secure safe, secure safe access and highway improvement works, including the new footway link, and mitigate harm to ecology, heritage assets, residents, wildlife sites, and protected species. And the application addresses drainage and contamination on site. A Section 106 can secure affordable housing, open space, NHS and education requirements and biodiversity net gain. On balance, it is considered that the proposals are acceptable. We've got one further update is that the report referred to in Condition 9 needs to be dated 2022 rather than 2020. So to conclude, the application is recommended for approval subject to the new and amended conditions as I have identified the conditions of the report and a section 106 agreement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Louisa. We've got no registered speakers for the parish councils or local members. And we have only the support of stroke applicant, Chris Hagen from Taylor Wimpy to address the committee. You'll have five minutes and the clerk will inform you when you've got one minute remaining. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, Chair and Members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you. My name is Chris Hagen and I am the Strategic Land Lead for Taylor Wimpy in the North East. Taylor Wimpy is a five-star house builder and our North East business is headquartered only 10 miles away from the application site with 32 directly employed staff from County Durham. We fully support your officer's report and the recommendation for approval. We have worked closely with consultees, particularly the design review panel, resulting in a reduction in numbers from 150 to 80 homes, addressing initial concerns raised in relation to accessibility and landscape impact. Phase one of our Chester Grange development in Pelton Fell has proven to be very popular with purchasers. Phase one is approximately 51% sold to date 
with 85% of buyers from within County Durham and 40% of those first time buyers. This calendar year, we will build 51 new homes with only three left to sell. In terms of the outline planning application before you, which would be a phase two to the current scheme under construction, our project team has worked with your officers to ensure that we've arrived at the very best scheme for the site. Robust, robust assessments have been undertaken, which demonstrate that the proposed development is technically sound, deliverable, and in compliance with local and national planning policy. The scheme would deliver a number of benefits, including at least 12 affordable homes for local people, at least eight homes for older people, which we intend to provide in the form of bungalows, new children's play area and financial contribution towards improvement of youth play facilities in the local area, financial contributions towards increased education capacity, new homes bonus payments and biodiversity net gain. We have engaged with local ward members throughout the determination of the application and have also recently committed to delivering additional off-site footpath improvements to improve the link between the site and the amenities within Pelt and Fell to the benefit of existing and new residents. In response to statutory consultation undertaken by the council, only a single objection has been received. This objection raised concerns regarding the highway's impact of the increased number of homes in the area. This has been addressed thoroughly in the transport, se transport statement submitted, which demonstrates that the local highways network has the capacity to accommodate additional new homes. The development is within walking distance of bus stops and the shops within, and services within Pelton Fell. We have also committed to a travel plan, which includes free short-term bus passes for new residents to encourage the use of local public transport. The objection has also raised concern regarding the pressure on GP surgery capacity. As part of the consultation exercise undertaken by the council, the local NHS trust has requested a financial sum to increase capacity. We have committed to provide this through the section 106 agreement. As set out in the officer's report and presentation, the matters, the matters raised in this objection have been examined and satisfactorily addressed. We respectfully urge you to grant approval for our outline proposals in line with the officer's recommendation. A positive decision on the planning application before you today would allow us to progress our reserve matters application and ensure build continuity, sustaining approximately 50 jobs on site daily and supporting the local supply chains such as Wensley Roofing based in Chesley Street. Thank you for listening. Myself and Michael Hepburn, our planning consultant from Litchfield, welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you for that, Chris. Just a question from myself to you, Craig. Is this adjoining your ward and whose ward is it? it it's pretty far away from me. I think it's a definite hour's walk there. Um, <laughs> it is the Chesley Street West Ward, Councillor Hennig, Councillor Fantoro Derby. Okay, well, they haven't chosen to speak, so I assume they've got no issues with it, but thank you for that. Anybody got questions for Chris and his friend? Alan. Yeah, George, um, just how soon would the, it's outlined permission, how soon would the, yeah, expect it at the start date, and also the play area you referenced, is that the offsite, the contribution, 118,000, is that for offsite, or is there going to also be a play area on site? So in terms of the, the play area, we're proposing, well, we're committed to providing a children's play area on site. The contribution in the officer's report is to upgrade youth play space elsewhere in the local area. Um, in terms of our outline application, well, sorry, delivery of the application in front of you, we're hoping to submit a request for pre-op next week. Phase one, the last property to be built on phase one finishes in December 23 and we're hoping to make a start in advance of that to ensure we have continuation so we're not carting site off site to then come on site as well. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Maura, Maura McKeon. Thank you Chair, I've been looking through the, um, the report I was just, um, I've not seen a detailed layout of um, pedestrian entrances and exits on the report itself. And I was just wondering um, if I could have a little bit more information about 
um, how easy it will be to get into and out of the site as a pedestrian. Can you come back on that, Chris? Yeah, so the application is in outline only at this stage with the illustrative master plan as we've shown. So I think it's the lines dotted in yellow which are the proposed footpaths within the site. So we've committed for all properties to be within 600 metres of a bus stop. There will be public footpath running alongside the roads within the site as well as informal paths as shown dotted yellow through phase one up onto Blue House Bank and we're also proposing to provide a footpath link to the public right of way as shown in the southeast corner of the site as well. Thank you and will the, um, where it comes to the um, the highway access, the, the vehicular access to and from the site, is there a footpath that runs alongside it and will there be a footpath that comes out with the um, with the access because there's a there's we've we've had an issue in my ward. I just wanted clarification. Yeah. So the main spine road. Well, sorry. Phase one access onto Blue House Bank has already been constructed. So we are proposing to maintain the main spine road through the site. So that road has footpaths on either side, and that will be continued through phase two. Thank you. Any further questions for Chris? You, Patricia. You might put your mic on, please. It says in the report that um, these roadworks uh, should be completed before um, the settlement is finished. Is that correct? Question for Louisa and who I would have been asking to come back now. Yeah, so it's worded, so prior to occupation of the first dwelling of the, first, the second phase. Brilliant, thank you. George, just while we're on that, because it was a question I was going to bring in, on the, because on the, on the first application, that, that um, highway improvement at Pictory Lane and Chelsea Street was part, was a condition on the first phase, and I was going to bring it in, like sort of, no work's actually happened. And now I notice it's been carried across into this phase. So is there a reason why it's never happened up till now? Just, having, just to assure you that it's it's on the um, traffic signals group. Uh, Durham's traffic signals group have designed that up, so it's it's going on to the, the forward plan for implementation. Thank you. So we move on to debate. Carl. Chair, yeah, just, just briefly, this is the village I, I grew up in. I've still got relatives and friends down here. We've seen over the, the past sort of 15 to 20 years, the enormous impact and transformation of the village um, from quite a rundown area to a village of opportunity with quite a diverse mix of housing um, across, the, across the entire area. And I think the, um, the, the application before us is well thought out um, you can see that there's not an awful lot of residents objecting um, to the scheme. And I think that's testament to the way Taylor Wimpies have carried out the first phase of the development and worked through things with the local community and the key sto stakeholders, such as the, um, the, the community partnership with the Brockwell Centre and the, the local doctor's surgeries and schools. So um, I'd just like to um, propose that we accept the officer's recommendations and approve the application. Thanks for that, Carl. Uh, Alan and then Cathy, please. Yeah, and I would go along and I would second that with Carl. Uh, definitely a good scheme. And the first one, is, is, as Carl alluded to, has been very successful. Um, the only question I had was on the on the schools, the contribution to the 165,000 for the secondary education provision. What's because the issue in the in in the former district area of, of Chelsea Street is the secondary schools. Um, where the Parkview and Hermitage are full to, to capacity. Um, obviously, sadly, Rosebury no longer, where children used to go to from Peltonfell, no longer is it in situ. So where's the 165? Who's it been aligned to? Because like, we have a, a gridlock situation in the, in the town centre where the, unless they're aligned up to um, 
I'm looking to Carl up to the North Durham Academy. This is provision up there, is the Carl? Yeah. So our understanding is that money would go to the Hermitage Academy, which is part of the North East Learning Trust Academy. Um, we haven't got definitive plans agreed for expansion of the secondary school, um, but it does appear to have room to expand and education haven't indicated that it could not be delivered. Um, so we would anticipate it would go to that school. Um, if it couldn't go to that school, it would probably go to the next nearest one. George, could I just have a supplementary on that one? The yes, and the... Yeah. What's happening in the past, because Parkview have been given pots of money aligned to Parkview, and unfortunately, part of, as, as you said there, there is, is the Hermitage Area Academy as our Parkview. Unfortunately, the, 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 the authority can't force them to take the money. And, like, and you know, I'm going to look back to, to many years ago, what was the British Oxygen site, and um, that 106 money is still sitting, hasn't been taken. Um, it's still like, coming into committee all like regular such as and the money's being taken off developers but there's no sort of answer here and we're just stockpiling the money in education in relation to the county council and the planning department need to sort of come up with something better to sort of say yes there's definite um school places because i know in the alumni division my division like we've got a situation where children can't get into the secondary schools and with them being academies the council can keep taking the money off developers, but they can't force the hand. So there needs to be some serious sort of um, work done around secondary school provisions because there isn't none and we're just stockpiling the money. There's nothing more or less. No, it's, no, it's just more or less a statement, isn't it, Alan? So Louisa couldn't. Cathy, did you want to come in next? I'm all right, Chair, thank you. Councillor Bell's covered. Sam. S sums there, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the, the, the applicant for the superb application on, on, on this. Um, it just goes to show that uh, applicants and officers of this council work, get together. They can work, to work, work together very, very well and come forward with an application such as this. Um, and the 106 money quite happy with i think it's been distributed evenly and fairly as as well as can be so um yeah just congratulations on a superb application and i will be voting for this thank you anyone else wish to contribute well i've got a mover and a seconder so all those in favor of approval yay that's unanimous today thank you <clears throat> we'll move on to the last application, land south of Spennymoor Electricity Substation, Thinford Lane, installation of an energy storage facility, including battery containers, power conversion units, transformers, substation, and uh, grid connection infrastructure, vehicle access, and associated works. With four registered speakers, for this item. But we'll start off asking Chris Shields to give his presentation, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, before we start, we have had some additional comments on the application. I just want to update you on. Um, Campaign for Protection of Rural England have written in an extra letter. Um, I know Richard Cowan's here and intends to speak, so I'll not go on too much on this. Um, but in general, they have raised the issue that the report doesn't reference guidance issued by the Energy Institute reason for that is it largely repeats um, adopted national and local planning policy, so we didn't think it was necessary in that respect. One of the issues raised by CPRA is in relation to fire risk from the site. Um, now that is in the Energy Institute guidance, but we don't think that is something that planning should focus too much upon. It's an operational issue. We shouldn't assume that something that isn't supposed to be on fire will be on fire. But to that end, we have agreed with the applicant uh, a condition for a fire prevention and management plan to be um, put in place prior to the development being brought into use. The second letter that we've received was from a resident um, 
who raised some issues with the proposed location of development, complaining that it isn't south of Spennymoor, but it's actually south of the Spennymoor substation, not south of Spennymoor. So that's the, the, the issue I think they've got confused about. The other issue they've raised is that the site is stated to be part of, um, oh, it's a site of historical interest as part of Butcher's Race Battle and Roman Road from Ferry Hill through Het to Durham City. As you'll see in the report, Design Conservation and the Archaeology Officers haven't raised any objections to the, the scheme. We've had geophysical surveys done by the applicant and that's identified a small area with a slight bit of interest but nothing significant. Nevertheless, there are conditions recommended for trial trenching prior to commencement development just to examine that to make sure there's nothing there. Okay. So the, the site is for a battery storage facility that would um, store up to 99.9 .9 megawatts of electrical energy. Uh, this is the site here, outlined in red. Um, we've got Spennymoor off to the west and Ferry Hill to the south, Cornforth to the east, um, Metal Bridge to the, the northeast here. Just off here is um, the, the Amazon development at Tursdale there. Oh, there's electri existing electrical substations to the immediate north of the site and then over the A68 to the north as well. In here, but not shown, um, is a gas, gas engine site producing electricity there as well. Site wouldn't be accessed from the A688, it'd be accessed from the, the C-class road to the east, from East Howell. Um, there is an existing track here, but it's to be upgraded to get to the site. It's an aerial view of the site. Um, it's a, we're gonna occupy part of a field, not this whole area. Um, you can see the existing substation to the north there and the, the additional one. Gas engines aren't shown yet, but they're under development. Uh, you see the developments occurring at Durham Gate here. The, the aerial photograph's a little bit out of date, so this is more developed now. This is a view looking north from Ferry Hill. Uh, the application site is within this, this yellow field here. It's not the, not the full area of that field. And the access heads out to the east, to East Howell, as, as I've already explained. This is a photo montage of what the site would look like. Now on here, it's shown the, the battery units displayed as, as white, but we've actually agreed with the applicant a condition that they could only be green to blend in better with, with the, um, the fields around it and the screening they're proposing. They've agreed to that condition. So that's year one. Um, it's difficult to see on this plan, but there is planting around it and mounding to, to screen it. Uh, we've also got photo montage from year 15, and that shows that the planting having grown up, and obviously it'll be growing in the intervening period. Uh, and if those units were green instead of white, we think there would be very low visual impact from this location. This is the site access from the C-Class Road into East Howell. So it's already a, a well-established access and the, the existing traveller site is uh, to the, the south of the road over here and the construction traffic would, would head into the south to the north. This is the indicator site plan around the edge, You've got mounding and that will be planted up as well. Attenuation pond to the south of the site. And then these are the, the battery units um, and the transformers between them and an additional substation to connect to the grid. So we've had no objections from statutory and internal county council consultees, subject to conditions where appropriate. Um, apologies that that second line shouldn't be there. That's a mistake. Ignore the, the Northern Gas Net Network's uh, comment. There are 24 letters of objection uh, we have had one additional one, so it's 25 now. Uh, one letter of support received in response to development. The issues raised include noise, dust and light pollution, traffic and road safety, loss of agricultural land, landscape harm, and risk of fire or explosion. CPRE has objected to development due to it not constituting renewable energy or essential infrastructure, and have raised concern in respect of landscape harm and the potential risk of fire explosion as well. Conclusion, the site provides grid balancing facilities to su support the national grid. The likely impacts have been carefully assessed and although some localised harm to the character, quality and distinctiveness of the local landscape, they would not be unacceptable. Mitigation measures are proposed to provide biodiversity net gain. Long-term management will be secured through planning obligation and there will be no adverse impact on ecological designations or flora and fauna. Although there will be a loss of land for arable production, this will be limited to the minimum amount to allow the development to go ahead. The proposals have generated some public interest. Concerns expressed regarding the proposals have been taken into account and carefully balanced against the scheme's wider social, economic and public benefits. 
The proposed development is considered a broadly accord with the relevant policy of the county term plan and relevant sections of the NPPF. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, on the card of my list, uh, Ian Geldad from Spennymoor Town Council was down and then he's not down. So we've got two objectors, Mr. Cowan from CPRA. Thank you. And followed by Mr. Storey. Uh, Mr. Storey requested, quite vociferously, I understand, that two and a half minutes weren't enough for you. So uh, I'll give both, uh, no, I don't need to talk to you. I'll give both of you four minutes and the applicant will then have eight minutes. So if you would go first, please, Mr. Cowan. Just will let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Uh, thank you, sir. I don't think I'll need that full time. Certainly, I have expressed concerns as they've been outlined. I do accept that this site is, or the area, is degraded by the current um, substation that is there, that is not a thing of beauty. But I think that the points that were raised by local residents on landscape are still relevant. Uh, but I was very concerned about the fire risk. Since I asked to speak, um, Mr. Shields and uh, uh, Mr. Reid have sent me the letter that has been referred to. Um, I have to say that I have to disagree with the planner that I do think that if something like this is being placed near to people, it is a material consideration as to whether or not it is a fire risk. Having said that, I think this letter, although I do not have the expertise to be able to comment on it, this letter sets out the sort of procedures that I was wanting to see accompanying the application. And I've seen the con uh, that it is proposed to put in a condition. And I, I, I think I would say that on that point, those answer my concerns as far as they go, uh, uh, as far as I am able to deal with them from an ex expertise point of view. So I wouldn't want to say anything further, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Cowan, very concise. It's over to Kevin's story, please. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I hope you'll give as much weight to the views of uh, residents and the people as you do to um, your officers. Um, today, to be clear, you're not being asked to decide if battery storage facilities should be built, nor are you being asked if green energy is a good thing. I think we can all take that as a given. You are being asked to decide if this large scheme should be placed smack in the middle of a set of arable land directly below a town that has very little open space already for its residents to use for recreation and exercise. The catastrophic effect on the landscape really can't be overstated. Uh, I noticed that officers have chosen to use words like notable and transformational, but in fact it's devastational. It is clearly contrary to planning policy 10 and policy 39. The officers themselves state this in paragraph 55 of their report and they repeat um, not that mitigation will uh, work, uh, given the photo montages you have seen. In fact, they stated um, it will cause extreme harm, and they say mitigation will not uh, obscure that, and they repeat that in paragraphs 56, 92, 93, 94, 95, and 98. They do not demonstrate, as is required under policy 27, that there is a need for this development at that location. They offer no evidence at all, but have merely parrot the developer's claims. The question of noise has not been addressed, yet once built, the the, and despite all of these assurances, it's the residents that will suffer. There is brownfield sites located in the region across the road, which will linger unused for decades uh, to avoid the expense of a bit of cabling. The applicant should be directed to investigate the potential of those sites. You should not approve this proposal today for the following reasons. First, because the whole report is about landscape and the detriment to it. £150,000 in business rates and a chunk of money to the landowner versus massive loss of amenity to a whole town is simply not 
in balance. Second, I ask you to uh, refuse it because the public are currently being consulted on yet another development on the same site or within metres of it. And the council and its officers do have a duty to take into account the cumulative effect of developments. There's not a single mention in this in the report, even though the public consultation for this whole thing, which is another 38 battery storage um, units, cooler houses, inverter skids, control rooms, management buildings, etc., etc. One minute remaining. Is planned for the western end of the site. So we have one on the, on the eastern end, we have one which will almost certainly come on the western end, um, on the eastern end, and now you're being asked the, to consider the very worst of all three sites uh, here smack in the south. If you approve this one, the committee, the worst option, the committee will have no option but to accept all the other proposals. In fairness to residents, members should hold, withhold a decision or better still refuse consent until the officers report on the cumulative effects. Finally, the issues about the site and the landscape. And to make a judgment without viewing the site and the landscape is quite irresponsible, as it's simply not impossible to understand the issue. I invite all of the members to come and see for themselves and better understand just what impact this will have on our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Story. Now we'll go over to the applicant, uh, Ms. Jenna Forkard, you'll have eight minutes, Jenna. And Kirsty will let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. The way we generate electricity is changing. Vast amounts of renewable sources of generation are increasingly being connected to our national grid network in order to address the pressing need to ensure security of supply, reduce reliance on fossil fuels, and to meet the UK's net zero targets to tackle climate change. The way we use electricity is also changing. We now use more electronic devices than ever, we charge our cars, and we'll soon start to heat our homes, primarily using electricity. Our national grid system is therefore in a transitionary period to manage these increasingly complex supply and demand needs. At any one time, the amount of energy we generate must be matched to the amount of energy we consume. If this balance isn't achieved, it can lead to blackouts and the failure of grid circuits. By storing electricity at times when generation exceeds demand, and then releasing electricity back to the grid network when demand exceeds generation, energy storage systems like the proposed Spennymore project are therefore essential for a stable and secure electricity system. The Spennymore energy storage system is a carefully cited and designed project. It optimises the land available for development to locate the project directly adjacent to the existing industrial infrastructure of the Spennymore substation where the project will directly connect whilst being positioned away from residential properties and outside of any national or local landscape designations. The total site area of the proposed Spennymore project is just 4.6 hectares, of which over 80% has been classified as subgrade 3B land, which is not considered best and most versatile. The site is currently used to grow crops for biofuel production and also cattle feed. The field where the proposal is located will, in most parts, be screened by existing vegetation or by new native woodland planting on top of funding. A significant landscaping plan is proposed, which, as well as reducing potential visibility of the project, will provide a plentiful source of food and shelter for a range of wildlife. We've taken account of feedback from the local community and from statutory consultees, and the battery containers will be finished in non-reflective, visually recessive colour, further reducing the visual impact. The site has also been designed to include significant biodiversity enhancement measures, such as the planting of new native woodland, species-rich grassland, and the creation of a pond. Further habitat enhancement potential in the form of bat and bird boxes, hedgehog houses, and other measures are also proposed, together providing a biodiversity net gain of nearly 25%. We have taken measures to minimise the impact on the public right-of-way, which would remain open throughout construction. A system of active management measures will be implemented, including safety signage, public right-of-way users given priority, and banks men used at key crossing points. Following construction, visibility from the public right-of-way would be largely limited by the woodland planting on the soil bunding proposed as part of the application. Onshore wind and large-scale solar are the cheapest forms of new electricity generation. By supporting their increased deployment, the Spennymore Energy Storage Project will benefit not just the UK's energy grid network, but all consumers. In addition, the project would provide around £150,000 in business rates each year to Durham County Council, used to fund vital services. 
Finally, this project <clears throat> has been subject to comprehensive environmental and technical review by statutory consultees, none of which have raised significant concerns that haven't been addressed or can't be mitigated by a condition. In conclusion, the planning balance is strongly in favour of this application. Therefore, we respectfully ask the planning committee to support this application in line with the officer's recommendation. If I've got time, I would just like to address the fire risk issue, which I hadn't included in my speech before it was raised by CPRE. So whilst there is no policy which uh, requires an assessment of fire risk in planning yet, I'd like to stress that fire risk is taken into account throughout our design process. It feeds into the site location, the layout, the spacing between equipment and the materials that we propose. In June of this year, we submitted a letter in response to CPRE's comments, which detailed the most credible risk with regard to fire and detailed the several layers of mitigation and protection which the system has to mitigate that risk, reducing it to as low as a low level as reasonably practicable. RES is the world's largest independent renewable energy company and health and safety is absolutely paramount to this continued success. We have experience developing these projects, but also constructing them, managing them and maintaining them. And so we are confident that we're leading on this matter. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, Janet. Does any member of the committee have a question for Jenna or the two objectors? Patricia. Thanks, Chair. Um, can you face your mic, please, otherwise we can't, can't hear you. Can I just ask, um, I don't know if I've missed it, I'm furiously trying to find it in here. Where is the power going to come from? To, to go into the batteries? Where is the supply coming from? So the power comes direct from the Spennymore Electrical Substation, which is directly to the north of the site. Right. It comes off the national grid as a whole into the battery, which charges. And then when energy is required on the grid again, it goes from the battery into Spennymore Substation and back onto transmission lines. Right. So it's not reliant on the solar farm that was refused? Nothing no. Nothing to do with that? No. Thank you. A very good question. Good answer. Does anybody else have a question? Alan. Thank you, George. Yeah, where's the, the current arrangement? Where's the electricity stored? Or isn't it? Do you mean um, where's it stored without this project? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. yeah, so currently there isn't energy stored at all here at this project uh, or at this Spennymore substation. In general, energy isn't stored anywhere on the, the network without these battery systems being installed. So that's currently why they're being rolled out across the UK. Thank you. We'll have more and then you can come back, Patricia. Thank you. Um, can you um, shed some light on the relationship between this um, proposed development and renewable energy in a bit more detail? Yeah, sure. It's a bit of a lesson in how the national grid works, I guess. So apologies if it gets too technical, please shout. Um, so as I said in, in the, the speech, the energy generated by our renewable sources and by coal-fired power stations at the minute has to be balanced exactly in line with what we're taking off the network, so what we're using at home and in our factories. Because renewable energy generation is intermittent, depending on weather conditions, if you imagine it's a, a calm night, there's no, the wind isn't generating, the solar isn't generating, that balance is completely out of, out of sync, out of whack. And that's what can cause blackouts or failure of grid circuits. So National Grid's job uh, effectively every millisecond of every day is to keep that balance in check. By drawing on the Spennymore electricity system, if that balance is in uh, out of whack, so there's no energy being generated by wind and solar, um, this battery system can discharge that energy back to the system, back to the network to bring that balance back into, into sync. So by calling on these flexible assets, that's essentially what they are, National Grid and, and developers can install more renewable energy projects because we can then deal with these imbalances. And that's how it's, it's linked. Hopefully that's not too in detail. Thank you very much, Jenny. You really know your stuff, but I'd expect no less. Patricia. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask why you didn't go for the Brownfield site, which is close by? Yeah, so I'm not sure which exact brownfield site you're talking about in detail, but um, so any energy storage system has to be located next to a substation or as close as possible to the substation where it's going to connect. Um, if it's further away than that, obviously there's long overhead lines, underground cables which have to be factored in, and there are losses along that line the further away you get, so the system is more effective and efficient when it's located next to a substation. Now the substation also has to have a grid connection capacity. This is it's scarce now across the UK, these connections that are available at the substations. 
this particular substation has a viable connection capacity for us, and that was our main target, really, for, the, for this site, and that's why it's located where it is. Thank you once again. Any further questions? Right, well, we'll open it up for debate then, please. Craig. Yeah, Chair. Um, I, I understand the, the residents' concerns about this, but I think as, as an application, we have to, as an application that, 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 that does appear, and, and I welcome the planning officers jumping on this issue in terms of the, the visibility and, and what it's going to look like and, and kind of pushing the applicant to really kind of do the utmost to shield this from people's views. Um, th this is something we kind of need in the coming future. You know, if, if we are going to have more renewable energy um, that is intermittent, we're going to need more facilities like this to, to, to take the load and to feed into the system. It, it, it needs to be done. And to be honest, if, if you were going to say to me, uh, would you rather see a coal-powered uh, coal powered, uh, power station near Ferry Hill or, or a nuclear power plant near Ferry Hill? Or would you rather have some containers that store batteries to kind of feed into the grid? I, I, I'd very much opt for that. And I think it's the applicants kind of demonstrate, and I'm sure the planning officers sort of agree on this, that the, the, the reason, the rationale of putting it here... Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it is not within this planning committee's ability to sort of say, we think this application would look better over there. We have to look at the application right in front of us. But they've demonstrated the need that it has to be within a close area of a substation. Um, and, it, and let's be clear, when you're looking at the maps, it is not near any kind of housing. It is, it is in the middle of kind of arable land that is not directly... In, in actual fact, I think reading the report... Um, there's going to be zero disturbance because it's nobody even comes and goes most of the time, sort of thing. So I'm I'm very much minded to approve this application, Chair. Thank you very much, Mara. Um, thank you, Chair. Again, I know the area really well because my ward is um, just to the north of the main road to the north of this site. Um, so I, I'm I'm very aware of of the surrounding area, and there's nothing that we can say on the basis of the evidence we've been given today to turn this down. There's no planning ground that we can stand on at an appeal. But also in Park Hill, which is an area that I represent um, in that ward just to the north of the site, that we had a power cut earlier in the year with one of the major name storms that came ripping through the county. And looking around at the councillors here, I think a lot of us have, have had that kind of experience. And we're gonna have more storms this winter because of climate change. And so even more settlements, probably Ferry Hill itself at some point is going to suffer from one of these power outages. We've got an ageing infrastructure nationally for power, and that's going to completely sucker our economy. Um, at some point, we have to say we need to be able to support renewable energy. Um, I, I, I can, being the councillor for HET and having dealt with this kind of issue before, completely understand where the objectors are coming from, but... Legally, there's nothing we can do as a council to turn it down. Um, and so I'll second Councillor Martin and support the application. Thank you, Maury. You really are on form today. Cathy, Cathy Hunt. Thank you, Chair. It is a very good application. Um, and it, again, I appreciate the need for these substations, etc. What I can't get my head around is why we're still using green belt and agricultural land to build these things on. Um, so for that reason, I can't support the application. Thank you. Uh, Peter, Peter Malloy. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Peter Malloy, spending more awards. Um, I understand what Jennifer said about the location of, of, of these batteries. However, taking on board um, that we might be contravening a couple of policies that has been mentioned in the report to do with the landscape and from there. Um, if this go ahead, we could be facing with another application just north of it from the uh, solar farm again. You know, we, we uh, knocked that back 
on on the same policies that came about. Um, and also, we are using up arable lands, irrespective of what its use is for. It's still less, so I will not be supporting this application. With that, Pete. Alan, did you have your hand up? Yes, please, George. Um, yeah, and the, the, my concern is that the loss of the agricultural field as well, from what their um, colleagues are saying. Um, maybe I should ask the, the applicant, but Chris, maybe you, the, the energy which is coming into the substation, is that co coming from a renew, renewable no. source? No. Because the applicant, I know the, the name of the applicant is re renewable, whatever, limited. Um, the energy which is coming into the substation that which then comes down to the batteries is that renewable energy or just coming off the grid uh, thanks council bill the energy that comes in the substation will be representative of the national mix which typically is about 50 percent renewable depending on where you are and times of day weather conditions etc do you want to add anything else chris that's been to what's been said uh, yeah, I can do. There's been some issues raised about whether it's contrary to policies 39 and 10 and also 27 in relation to infrastructure. Um, obviously, I, I take on board the um, objector's point in relation to it being contrary to those policies, but those policies aren't, if you don't, if it isn't perfect, it fails. They are, yes, we see the harm, but there are benefits that can outweigh that harm. So my recommendation is those, those policies, it's not in conflict with those. It, uh, the, the, the benefits of the scheme actually outweigh the harm and therefore it, it, uh, it's uh, in conformity with those policies. So in terms of need, there's no need, no need to demonstrate that to pass policy 27. It's just essential infrastructure and therefore it's, it's okay in respect of that policy. It therefore also passes policy 10 as being an exemption um, to be allowed within the countryside. I uh, hope that helps. If there's any further questions, happy to answer them. Oh, one from myself, Chris. I don't know. It was mentioned there's a further application pending or a consultation. Whereabouts would that be? Uh, yes, Chairman. Um, this is an inquiry, and I'm not exactly sure where it would be yet. It's it's either to the west or, or the or the east of the site of the substation. Sorry, but at the moment, that's that's not a planning application. It's not approved. It's not built. So we can't take that into consideration as part of cumulative effect. Essentially, all we can consider here is the application that we actually have. Because as an inquiry, it might, they might not be brought forward as an application, and it certainly might not get planning permission after that. So we can't take that into account yet. All we can judge is the application we have before us. Yeah, I'm aware, aware of all that. I was just wondering where it might be if there's a consultation about it. The, we've got a, a map. Can you, Joe, uh, explain where it might be on that map, where the consultation is? This is uh, Councillor Joe Quinn. Uh, so he... Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, if you hold the red light where the substation is, the immediate right of that, that's where it's going to be, according to the consultation map. Right, thank you. We, we're not actually uh, able to discuss that, but it's just out for my own interest. Anyone else wish to contribute, please? Carl, Carl Marshall. Which I think the, the problem with this is there's only very limited locations where you can put these batteries, and I think that's been outlined by the applicant and by the, um, by the plan officer. I think if we, you know, the, 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 these facilities do support the grid, um, you know, I think, I think regardless of, of where the electricity is produced, we'll have peaks in the day when the, there's, there's pressures on the grid and we have um, troughs in the day where, where there's extra capacity in the grid. And I think um, this sort of more innovative, quirky form of battery storage helps to take electricity out of the, out of the, the, the grid system um, and then, then puts it back in when we need it more. I think, um, I think from my point of view, um, it's very difficult um, as a committee to argue um, on one hand um, in applications that we need to consider renewables and supporting the grid and then in the very next application vote against them because they take up arable land you know we are stuck with locations where there's the grid con connectivity 
and usually they are next to, to fields, unfortunately. I think that um, from my point of view, when, when I've listened to everything on this particular application, I see no planning grounds to knock it back and I'm fully supportive of approving the scheme and um, going a little way to tackling the climate emergency. Thank you for that, Carl. Not to labour the point because it's not relevant today really, but this further application that is under consultation, is it from your group, Jenna? No, it's not from Res. It's uh, another developer, nothing to do with us. But again, as, as Chris has said, it's co consultation stage. It may not even come to a full application. Thank you. That's just curious to myself. Anyone else wish to... Uh, well, we've got to... Uh, do I have a mover and a seconder? Yeah, yourself, Craig, and Maura. The recommendation is for approval. All those in favour? All those against? Right. Will it become 6 6 if I vote? I was just debating with myself whether I was going to vote on, on this one, which would uh, then give me the casting vote. As reluctant as I am to lose any agricultural land, I think in this case I've got to support the application. So I, I won't be voting, but it's come out 6-5 for approval. Thank you. And that concludes today's business. Thank you for your attendance. If you'll just give Alan a minute to uh, switch off.